And good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Spotlight on Diabetes. Uh, as Bob said, today is Stem Cell Awareness Day, and we're here to learn a little bit more about juvenile diabetes. We're very excited to have Dr. Peter Butler from UCLA's Geffen School of Medicine and Dr. Beji from Novacell. We also have a diabetes patient and advocate, Joelle Johnson, who's going to talk to you a little bit about her experience living with juvenile diabetes. A couple of years ago when we did our first Spotlight on Diabetes, um, I was learning just enough about stem cell research as a, as a clinician and non-researcher to be a little skeptical about whether we would see real progress against diabetes in what I expected would be the limited lifespan of the CIRM. Today, I think you're going to hear from some researchers who have, through their work, given me some reason to be a lot more optimistic about what we just might accomplish. Dr. Butler is the director of the Larry Hillblom Islet Research Center, professor of medicine and chief of endocrinology, diabetes, and hypertension at the UCLA Geffen School of Medicine. His specialties include endocrinology and diabetes, of course. His research has focused on abnormal insulin secretion in diabetes, the causes of beta cell death, and I think most exciting for me, the possibility to foster islet regeneration in people with diabetes. He received his MD from the University of Birmingham in the UK in 1980, and did his residency at the University of Edinburgh, Birmingham in the UK, and also uh, was a postdoctoral research at the, researcher at the Mayo Medical College in Rochester, Minnesota. He was chief of endocrinology and diabetes at USC before coming to start the Hillblom Research Center here at UCLA. And as a clinician, he's published very extensively on his research in both juvenile and type 2 diabetes. Dr. Butler. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a tremendous honor to be here. And uh, <clears throat> having taken care of people with diabetes now for uh, almost 30 years, uh, maybe I can share with you, as I know we have some uh, school children listening, and um, <clears throat> something I once overheard my son say. So we have a microscope at home, and my son's friend saw this microscope sitting on the, uh, on the desk and asked, what is this? And <clears throat> my son's uh, uh, response was, uh, it's a microscope. Uh, the son's friend said, well, why is there a microscope here? And, and my son said, well, my dad does diabetes research. And so this friend was impressed and said, well, that's great. Um, uh, and my son said, no, but I don't think he's very good at it. And so I was listening. I was in the kitchen cooking. I was kind of a bit taken aback by this. Uh, oh. So um, he, he, the friend said, well, why not? And he said, well, he has, he's been doing it for years. And diabetes seems to be just as much of a problem as it always was, as far as I can tell. But, and actually, from the mouths of babes, it was, I thought, wow, he's right. <laughs> um, and the exciting thing, I think, right now is that we truly do have some progress uh, that we haven't had for many years in the field of diabetes research. So <clears throat> I'm gonna start by showing you a slide that has a part of an email extracted that arrived to me yesterday. Uh, and since I have the privilege of working at UCLA and with a great research group, I have many um, and publications through that group and through these days through the internet, people find you and, and this is a typical email <clears throat> uh, that I extracted some of that arrived just yesterday. Our daughter Delaney was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes last Sunday. My wife and I are still in shock, denial, and everything else. Delaney is six years old and went from being terrified of needles one day to having six shots per day and 10 finger pokes for the rest of her life. This is simply a tragedy. Um, <clears throat> I probably get one or two emails along these lines every, every week. And so I can assure you that no one is more motivated with this uh, 30-year accretion of the tragedy of diabetes for so many families uh, <coughs> to improve their situation. I don't know how this pointer works, if it does, if anybody from, no? Between the yellow lines, okay. There we go, thank you very much. So let me first of all, to set the stage, very briefly tell you about how the um, system glucose metabolism is supposed to work, since I know we have people listening in who are not medically or scientifically trained. Glucose is a fuel that our brain needs. And so the blood sugar is very tightly regulated. And even when you're asleep at night and you haven't eaten for maybe 10 hours, your blood sugar remains very constant because your liver, shown here, releases sugar into the blood 
glucose at a rate that matches the rate that you're taking glucose out of the circulation. So the question then is, how does the liver know how much glucose to put into the blood? And the answer is, this is where the pancreas comes in. <clears throat> the pancreas, shown here, reads or measures the amount of glucose in the circulation and releases insulin <clears throat> every four minutes in little squirts into the circulation. And this insulin works on the liver and it constrains the rate that the sugar is released. So it damps it down. <clears throat> and this is the normal situation. So <clears throat> when you eat your breakfast, you have more glucose arrive into the circulation, and the glucose levels rise, insulin is released, it damps down how much new glucose is put into the blood and balances for the glucose that's just been uh, <clears throat> entered the blood from the meal. So it's a feedback system very much like your thermostat at home regulating, for example, the <clears throat> if you have your air conditioning re regulating the temperature of uh, the air. So the important part for our interest today is the pancreas, shown diagrammatically here. And part of the problem about uh, <coughs> diabetes is that the pancreas, this large organ here, is very inaccessible. It's very inconvenient because it's at the back of your abdomen, right behind all of the uh, structures within your abdomen. And 99% of this big organ that's about the size of your hand is actually involved in making digestive juices that go into the bowel to digest your food here as it passes through. And there are one million little tiny groups of cells in the pancreas named islets of Langerhans after the German medical student who found them. And these islets <coughs> are about two to 3,000 cells each. Each of these little purple structures here is a single cell that makes the hormone insulin and releases it into the blood circulation in response to the circulating glucose. So this is an islet from a person who doesn't have diabetes and has about the right number of beta cells, the type of cells that make insulin within it. In contrast, if I now show you islets from someone who's just developed type 1 diabetes and someone who's had type 1 diabetes for a longer period of time, you can tell that there's less of these purple cells and less still and less still. So what's happening is these cells that make insulin are being uh, destroyed, and they're being destroyed because unfortunately the person has an immune system that has mistaken them for <coughs> a, a foreign and is making these cells that are shown in red here that are attacking the, the cells that make insulin shown in green here. This is again from a human pancreas, and <coughs> these red cells are killing off the cells that make insulin. So unfortunately, there is an error, and slowly, over the course of uh, years, uh, probably typically several years, these cells are taken away and destroyed. And as a consequence then, instead of having this system in place to regulate the blood glucose, the <coughs> insulin secretion disappears, and now the liver just makes tremendous amounts of sugar and the glucose level rises in the blood. So that is the thing that has gone wrong. So let us return to our <coughs> new diabetic De uh, Delaney, age six, and let's go through what would have happened if she developed diabetes at different times. Had she di de developed diabetes in 1920, she would have died within a year of diagnosis. She wouldn't have made her eighth birthday. And <coughs> the discovery of insulin in the 1920s was truly one of the great medical mir miracles. Because now, after that, she would have received insulin <coughs> obtained from pancreases from the slaughterhouse, from pigs, and she would have received insulin, <coughs> and she would have lived. But when I went to medical school, the consequences would have been that she would have still died very young. She probably would have become blind, most likely lost her limbs, had developed kidney failure, she would have been told it was too dangerous for her to have pregnancy and would have been sterilized when young. So this was, at the time I went to medical school, truly a horrific disease. Now, at 2008, where Delaney has this, things have improved tremendously. Her life expectancy is almost normal, according to the CDC, as long as she has appropriate care and she's able to follow these, that care. The complications are much less common. She should have normal pregnancies if she wants, with no difference to people who don't have diabetes. 
So with all that, <coughs> why does it matter? My neighbor, <coughs> excuse me, my neighbor in La Cunada is uh, has a six-year-old son. He pointed out to me with his little calculator that he is going to have to have 250,000 shots if he lives his normal life expectancy. So yes, things are better, but this is not normal. This is truly, thank you so much, this is really a disease that is still very intrusive in lifestyle. Any of you who are fathers or, or mothers, imagining your little girl or son requiring 250,000 shots uh, just to, to remain uh, at school with the other kids. So now this is the structure that we're missing. In order to reverse this disease, this is what we have to replace. And so the challenge is, how can we replace it? Very briefly, what I'll tell you about is where these cells come from. This graph shows you the numbers of beta cells versus age in uh, humans. And it shows that normally we grow our beta cells at a tremendously fast rate between birth and the age of teenage life. So by the age of five, we've pretty much got the number of beta cells we're going to have as an adult. And this is interesting because many of you know that people often develop type 1 diabetes when they're teenagers. At this kind of age here, when they're growing very, very fast, and if you go back to this diagram, <clears throat> they're no longer growing the numbers of beta cells anymore. So <clears throat> it's perhaps not surprising that there's an increased risk of diabetes at that age. The way the, diabetes, the beta cells grow <clears throat> is shortly after birth, there's a very high rate of replication of division of those existing beta cells. <clears throat> and then this drops off, so by the time you reach five, you're not making very many more beta cells through replicating existing beta cells anymore. <clears throat> Dr. Beishi is gonna show you that when he makes embryonic stem cells into beta cells from human st uh, embryo studies, these beta cells undergo a transition from high rate of replication shown in red here down to this rate of replication, very closely mirroring what we see in humans. Uh, and this is very encouraging because it suggests that these cells not only have the capacity to expand in number in the same way as uh, adult humans, uh, but also that they have the uh, uh, intelligence to stop dividing and becoming mature cells which reduces their risk of becoming malignant as time goes on. During adult life, the term, circumstance where we most commonly try to increase the number of beta cells we have is if we get overweight, as shown in this picture here. And if you look at uh, the numbers of beta cells or the collected number of beta cells in people who are lean versus people who are overweight, we do see that adults do have a capacity to increase the number of beta cells they have. So that means that although the replication of beta cells disappears during adult life, there is some means to increase the numbers of beta cells. But a caution here, most of the science that is pursuing this is being done in mice. And let me show you the same data here in humans, again, on the same scale as what happens in mice that, get, uh, that are obese. And you'll see there's a tremendous capacity for making new beta cells in mice that is much, much less in humans. And so I think one of the big cautions is that just because we can cure diabetes in mice through beta cell regeneration does not necessarily mean the same strategy is going to work in humans. It's a caution we have to be very careful of. So where do beta cells come from? As I said, during childhood, there's this period of rapid beta cell replication, which Dr. Beishi's uh, embryonic stem cells also are capable of, balanced by loss of beta cells. But in fact, <coughs> We think that there are other sources of beta cells, stem cells within the pancreas, that also contribute once you reach adult life. And these become a source of great interest to us, I think, for beta cell regeneration in people with diabetes. We've recently undertaken studies to measure these, which I won't give you great details of, other than to simply show you that <clears throat> monkeys here are very similar to humans when they don't have diabetes. This is a human with type 1 diabetes with reduced numbers of beta cells. This is a monkey with reduced numbers of beta cells because we have given it a toxin, streptocytosin. And we have studied these monkeys where we've biopsied the pancreas over time to look at the dynamics of beta cell uh, formation and loss. And when we do that, looking at this little bathtub system again, in adult monkeys like humans, there is ongoing beta cell turnover. They're making new beta cells, 
both from replication of existing cells relatively few and other sources of beta cells, and this is being balanced by ongoing loss of beta cells, so that in other words, you aren't, <clears throat> this system isn't static. Just like we make new skin cells, we make new hair cells, we are making new beta cells uh, continuously uh, to replace the ones that are eventually uh, <coughs> dying off. And after making these monkeys diabetic, the process continues, but in fact we have to be uh, uh, careful because if you'll note, the numbers of new beta cells coming into the system has decreased. So yes, there's a capacity for regeneration, but the capacity seems to decrease as a consequence of the diabetes. So that it would be important to understand why these stem cells are less effective at replacing the beta cell mass in the context of diabetes, and that's an important area of investigation. The, the other strategy is to say, let's make beta cells from somewhere else and fill up the bathtub. And I think that is <coughs> essentially uh, something we need to push to because Delaney and her 250,000 shots lined up is not willing or interested in, in having that many uh, in, injections. And I think with Dr. Beishi's presentation, uh, like to Dr. Prieto, I actually believe now that this is truly an option that we can reach. So I'm going to <coughs> throw out this uh, uh, slide to end on here to say that in 1920, Delaney would have died within a year of diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Discovery of insulin was a medical miracle. I believe that in the year 20, question mark, 10, 11, 12, I've already challenged uh, Ed that this should be 10 here. There will be the first planted, implanted human embryonic stem cells derived from islets, derived islets, and this truly will be the next medical miracle. And I have to say I'm very proud as a Californian taxpayer and a Californian voter that I can uh, look on at what I believe is going to be one of the greatest accomplishments in medicine. And, and I will be a big cheerleader for you guys because I believe you collectively are going to do this. I have a patient here and I pr promised Joelle um, that I won't retire until this has been accomplished. Uh, this is a picture of how us Brits uh, partake of retirement. So you can come and see me, Joelle, um, clad in the usual British bikini here. Uh, <clears throat> but I hope that I don't have to wait too long uh, for this. And, and I'm sure that you will um, <clears throat> have pleasure in coming to visit me without needing to bring your glucose meter with you. So I thank you very much. And I think I now <clears throat> hand over to Ed.